Welcome, friends, to Crazy Women Country, where women's voices matter. We bring you the greatest female voices in the music industry. From the artists, songwriters, and producers, to managers and executives, and all the women who make the music industry what it is today. Thank you for joining us. Welcome, friends, to another episode of Crazy Women Country. Today, we have a special guest, Miss Lacey J. Dalton. How are you doing? Oh, Donna, I'm so happy to be with you today. It's been, we've had a nice conversation off, uh, offline, and uh, I'm glad to be here with you today. And I'm, um, I'm thrilled at, of the, at the work that you are doing for women in this country, uh, especially for uh, women in music, who I just found out uh, are only 12% of the people who are actually at the top of the charts. That's absolute. I, I know that in the uh, in the 80s and 90s, I think it got better for women. And I was not aware until a very short time ago that it had dropped back to where women are, again, only 12% um, uh, of, of who who's having hits and being recorded and so on and so forth. That's um, that's a bad step backward. And it's, a, it's an incorrect step backward. Women have a lot to say today. And we need to let them say it. Absolutely. I can't agree more, obviously, because you see what I'm doing and I'm just trying to help bring women back out and, you know, introduce people to the women they won't hear on the radio. I mean, granted, I was blessed in the 80s and 90s to hear all the women on the radio. But today, I mean, half of the women I'm, I've listened to, I've never known them on the radio, you know, like Erin Enderlin, Brandy Clark, even Brandy Carlisle, you know, like we can go that route. I mean, there's just so many amazing women that never heard on the radio. And I would have never heard of them had I not sought them out myself. So this is important work that you're doing. This is very important work. Thank you. Uh, how did you feel about uh, Bonnie Raitt winning the Grammy for a song she that, wrote, by the way? That was amazing. I was just totally beside myself watching it. I was just like, oh, that is so awesome because you could see how she, surprised she was too. And then it was just yeah well deserved i don't think well anybody deserved. doesn't love i don't think anybody doesn't love bonnie Raitt. how could you not love her i mean she's just awesome right i don't know she's she's truly a wonderful artist and a really great musician um mm -hmm. i had the pleasure of we shared a lot of people our crews on the road were often the same people and uh, i think i only met bonnie once but it was of course just like you would imagine just really warm lovely person and my crews loved her they love to work for her and, and um they'll tell you they'll tell you who the real people are <laughs> if you find out <laughs> who's doing somebody's sound and lights you're going to find out a lot about the person's character if they work for them for a while well speaking of telling about before. someone's character why don't you tell me we like to start with the difficult question first and get it out of the way okay in your words who is Lacey j dalton Lacey J. Dalton is um, is uh, someone who started in a very ordinary, lovely. Not it wasn't really ordinary because I grew up um, in a family where my dad was a guide on a hunting preserve and a, an NRA instructor, and we he later became a guide in a. In a a hunting reserve uh, in the last part of his life, which is what he always had wanted to do. And he became head guide, which was great. And we grew up on uh, deer that he shot and rabbits and grouse and, you know, all sorts of uh, wild game because we didn't have a lot of money. So we grew up, uh, I grew up in northern, northeastern Pennsylvania, not too far from where you grew up. And uh, we, uh, my mother worked in, in uh, restaurants and then she got her licensed to become a beautician and she became a beautician so i had this sort of deer hunter beginning and then when i was 21 i was selling um, jewelry for big joe ryan underneath the grandstand at the bloomsburg state fair which was as big as any fair i have ever seen it was it used to be this huge fair and they had mm -hmm. trotting horse races well underneath the grandstand big joe ryan from philadelphia sold um jewelry and us kids would go down there every year 
and we would get a hundred bucks to stand there under the grandstand on the concrete for a week and sell this jewelry. And I was still there. I was uh, selling jewelry and I was just, I was 20 years old and it was in September. And across the way was this long haired hippie selling psychedelic rock and roll posters. And one thing led to another and we ran off together to California to a commune in Capitola, California. And because we were interested in what was going on with the flower children, we had no idea what it was all about, but we wanted to know. So we hopped in a Carmen Ghia in a blizzard, which lasted all the way across the United States. I had to sit sideways in the Carmen Ghia and hold the door shut. And we tied it shut, but it didn't go all the way <laughs> close. It's a blizzard, okay? And I mean, it is a blizzard. And um, I had $20 and a guitar that my dad gave me and a suitcase full of books. And that is how I arrived in California in about 1967, I think. And we uh, were in this commune. We had a psychedelic rock and roll band. And all the time. So here are the two completely, utterly different lifestyles. Utterly different. I'm so glad that I started the way I did. I'm so glad that I had the courage to leave that little town of Bloomsburg and go into this amazing adventure. And I knew I was very scared, but I did it anyway. And we arrived at the California border and we were at uh, state line up in Lake Tahoe. And that's where the, you know, it's, uh, there's a, the lake, you can see the lake and it's just right where the California and uh, Nevada border come together. And the minute we arrived at that place, just before we crossed into California, the blizzard stopped. The sun burst out through the clouds, and all the trees had long icicles that were dripping with rainbows of light. And it was though spirit said to me, now you are where I need you to be. Learn what you need to learn here. Be who you become here. And it was in California that I really became much, much more than I ever thought I could be. And, you know, later got record deals and did that whole thing. But always writing, not because uh, I never had that thing of really wanting to be a star. I just never had that thing where I thought that was what I wanted. What I wanted to do was be able to continue to do my music, which is why I signed the record deal with country music which I was very familiar with because my mother and father played country music and my sister and I grew up hearing it. Her, that's all I ever heard, that and Perry Como. <laughs> I think you probably are old, old Perry Como. I do know who Perry Como is. Uh, I was a big Leslie Gore fan as well. So yeah, I can okay, Gary Puckett. Okay, great, <laughs> great taste, great taste. But anyway, the person that I came to be through those the meeting of those two very disparate lifestyles is the person that i'm very happy to be now i'm very happy to be myself um i got the big ride for a while in in nashville and that was not a comfortable thing for me that was that was not i wasn't happy with with that because i wasn't allowed to express myself the way i wanted to back then if you were a woman in country music you had to really fight to get half of what you really believed in on an, I had a great producer. My first producer was the great Billy Sherrill, who, uh, you know, found Tanya Tucker and um, uh, George Jones. and Well, not Tanya. He did produce Tanya later, but George Jones and Tammy Wynette and Ray Charles almost to the end of his life and all these wonderful people. But he had other, he had crazy people. He had people like uh, Johnny Paycheck. And David Allen Coe. So he signed me, actually, when I got signed to him, I was signed as an outlaw artist because of, because of a song that I had written with my longest friend in Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania. We've been friends since we were seven years old. And we wrote a song together. She came, was recovering from a divorce, and she came out to stay with me in this little cabin in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And I put on a pot of coffee that morning, and um, she and I, uh, she was sleeping, and I took a broom handle and hit it on the bottom of the loft that she was sleeping. And I said, Mary, come down and have coffee with me. You, you're in the perfect mood to write this song. And we wrote the song Crazy Blue Eyes. And that was the beginning in 1979 
I was signed to the CBS Records and Billy Sherrill, and that was the beginning of that that part of my life. But there was always there were always other influences in my music because I had listened to Bob Dylan and Joan Baez and later Janis Joplin and and the Jefferson Airplane, the Jefferson Starship, people like the New Riders of the Purple Sage. And, and so there was always this other side of me that wanted to express. And so after a number of years as a recording artist in Nashville, I went independent. And at that time, at the time that I went independent, um, uh, I had no choice. They were asked, telling me to find my options. So I was probably, I, when I was signed, I was 33 years old. So that was like this great scandal in Nashville that somebody that ancient could be signed to a record. I wish they could see me now, <laughs> really. <laughs> but but the bottom line is, you know, they thought I was just, you know, this ancient crone at 33. And um, so I, I, I was, uh, I always had that, I always had to go up against that thing of being older, having an idea about the kind of music that I wanted to do. And Billy and I had a deal. I won't put anything on the record that you hate, and you don't put anything on the record that I hate. And we'd meet in the middle. And we were able to produce a lot of wonderful things that way. But when I went to other producers in Nashville, and I had some wonderful other producers, but I was uncomfortable with the business of music because that's not why I do music. I didn't. I was so naive, I didn't realize that if you're really smart you pay attention to all that stuff um, because it allows you to keep going forever and ever. But I've gone forever and ever anyway, on my own, with my freedom, the freedom to say anything I want to say, anytime I want to say it. So I've had, in, in some ways, I've had a very blessed um, uh, life, even though, you know, I'm not at the top of the charts. A lot of people, you know, many people think that I and uh, already uh, on the other side. And we had a funny thing happen. My manager, I was going down to be inducted into the International Hall of Fame, and um, she had a T-shirt made for me that said, not dead yet, <laughs> because I think a lot of people, she's still alive. Yes, she still is. Yeah. And I just had a funny experience with that. David Frizzell loved the T-shirt so much that he had one made too. And then we had our pictures taken with our not dead t-shirts on. And we had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people hitting the thing, not for me or David, but for the not dead. Where do we get the not dead yet t-shirt? <laughs> so um, that's, uh, that's where I am now. And that's how I became who I am now. The experience of Nashville was a whole other stretch in another direction from what had happened in California and a whole nother stretch from what how I've been raised. And so I have a lot of influences in my music and in my life and in my soul. And uh, I sit before you a combination of many, many things. Well, I love that you are many, many things and you speak your mind because <laughs> one of the most recent releases that you had was Texas Taliban. I know we talked a little bit before we came on about it, but it is such a good song because, you know, and we were talking that I now live in Florida that, you know, it's, it's so sad to see how so many people in politics are trying to push things on people and, and, and they're, they're you know, that we elect them thinking they're going to represent us and then they don't. And it, it's, it's one of those catch 22s, but we need to, you know, it just kind of spoke out very, you know, modestly and said, Hey, you know, and I, that's what I loved about that song myself. It was just very, here it is. This is what I'm thinking. This is what we're thinking. We're, there's a lot of us thinking this, and so. But it's not. Um, it's not a mean song. It's not a hateful no. song. Mm -mm. It's really not. That's not why I wrote it. What I wrote. It, the reason I wrote that song was to say, "Look what you're doing. Look what you're doing." Do you know that song? There's a verse in that song that goes, "Every living yea who waving round his gun." Thou shalt not kill, but some fool will. The deed's as good as done. And everybody loves his guns, Democrats, Republicans, and I ain't one to spoil the fun, but what do we do with the crazy ones? Do you know when that song came out? And I didn't do it. On per I mean, it just happened. On the day of Uvalde. And I'm still grieving for Uvalde. And I'm still grieving. 
for Tyree Nichols. And I'm still grieving for the Keenan, what's his name, the kid two or three weeks ago, the, the teacher. There's somebody every week, Brianna Taylor, you know, all these people. This is, what is it going to take? What's it going to take? And I think what it's going to take is women need to stand up to it. I think women need to, women, we have the children. We are the mother bears. And we need to say, this has got to stop. And I don't care how you do it. But we've got to find a way to have better, more informed and better policing. I don't have a problem with cops. I've worked with cops my, my whole life. I, you know, a lot, you know, I don't have a problem with that. I've worked in prisons. I've taught in prisons. And I don't have a problem with cops. I just don't. But I do have a problem with bad cops and bad policing and violence. And we need to find ways around that. And I believe you're going to see that the women are the ones who are going to find it because we're fed up. I don't know if everybody is as fed up as I am, but I'm fed up with it. I don't want to see it anymore. And if I'm a mom and my kids are fighting, I'm going to say, you go in that corner and you go in that corner. And when you can finally talk to each other as human beings, then we're going to work this out. And we're not going to have this violence. We're not going to have this fighting. And I think women need to do that. And I think women are the ones who need to do it. And we need to somehow pull us together. I want to, I hope that spirit will give me a song for women that will bind us together in the divine feminine energy. And speak to these um speak to these uh injustices that are happening that are uh, just so utterly appalling at this you know i've told you before though this world is not a child anymore it's time for us to grow up and somebody needs to be the adults in the room and i'm not sure it's the politicians we have right now i'm not sure it's them i don't think that i think a lot of them are just terrible role models and not you know, not really giving the bulk of the people. Most of the people aren't really getting what they want. There's about 33% of the people who are getting what they want. And that's violence. And I'm not for that. I am right with you on all of it. Absolutely. We all are. There's so many of us in the middle. So many. The right is too far right. The left is too far left. We've got to pull back to where the adults are. We can't let these, you know, the right pull us into whatever it's doing and the woke pull us into the left pull us into the other thing. We, the, we need to learn to talk to each other and find common ground. Mm -hmm. Common ground. And that may be the title of the song. We need to be able to learn to find common ground, to sit like grown up people and work out these ways to be nonviolent. The greatest teachers in the world, Jesus, yes. Mahatma Gandhi, Paramahansa Yogananda, these people who were peaceful people, nonviolent people, they are, when we think of the great souls, that's who we think of. Mm -hmm. We don't think of, you know, some conquering, you know, person that just i mean you know genghis khan was amazing you know alexander the great was amazing but when we think of the really great souls we think of the the gandhis and you know the martin luther kings and the non-violent people those are the way showers that is the way jesus christ was a way shower he preached non-violence he wasn't a pussy you know, he was a pretty tough guy, actually. You know, when he threw over those tables uh, in the temple with the money count counters, he didn't just throw the tables over. He bound together a bunch of leather straps and beat the crap out of them. So he wasn't just a wimp, but he wasn't the kind of person that would go and murder them all. Right. Just because he could. Mm -hmm. People need to be corrected. We need corrections. We do need corrections because some of us just simply can't get along. We need corrections, but we do not need this 
endless, forever violence. And I think all of us, I don't think anybody really disagrees with that, except the people who really are, you know, wanting violence. And they're pretty out front about it. There's some people who are pretty out front about wanting to be violent and have violent overthrows of things. And oh, for heaven's sakes, grow up. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, what? It, it's, you know, some even just simple laws that to help out would be would be, you know, like we all agree. I think the nation in general, like, you know, gun laws, we all agree in common sense gun laws. Right. I mean, there's no reason why. Do I own a gun? Yes. Would I go for a psyche eval every year? Absolutely. I would. Why? Because if that's what like over in other countries that don't have a lot of gun violence or barely have any guns. You know, that's what they do. They do psychs. They have your bullets and your weapon have to be separate. You know, like they have those little law things that you must have locked away and this and that. And, you know, if we're responsible gun owners, why don't we do it? Well, we are going to do it. But the point is, we need to make certain things clear to the, everyone else. And I don't think I think the problem is no one wants to go too far against anyone because they want to all be liked. And, and I think that's where it comes down to is, is that you don't have those that definitive okay let's do this let's let's correct and and move forward and no one wants to be the person to say oh yeah we're going to correct this and do this and and you know it's it's it seems like they just spin in circles is the way i i think is uh i've used that term before is it spins in circles and that's eventually it'll good, come that's a pretty good analogy yeah because that's what it feels like doesn't that's, it? <laughs> Yes, and yes, things aren't things don't seem to get resolved. But you know, my friend in Texas had a good idea. He said, "I don't know why we don't just have um, gun licenses like we have um, licenses for our cars. You go in, you take it. You have to learn. The NRA used to be. I don't know. I think they still do this, but I don't believe they do it to the extent that they used to. The NRA used to have wonderful teaching." of how to use guns and handle guns. And there are countries in the world, there are some countries who in high school, you have to learn how to take a gun apart and put a gun back together. And these are these are countries that don't have a lot of violence. Everybody knows what they're doing. They know the rules. There need to be rules. And I think there need to be licensing. And if you can't, if you lose your license, you can't shoot your gun for a couple of years. Sorry. You know, it, it's, uh, you know, the I, my father had a point that I always, I'll never forget. We spent a year and a half in the German prison camp. He was shot down over Belgium out of an airplane. And he lived through that and ended up in a prison camp for a year and a half. And he did say to me one time, he said, you know, if they ever do register your guns, don't do it. And I said, Daddy, why not? He said, because that's how the Nazis in Germany knew where all the guns were. And they went and got them and the people couldn't defend themselves. I do think that there may be a time in this country where we will be very grateful that we have the world's largest standing militia. There may be a time for that. So we need to find a compromise. We need to find a way to uh, make sure that the real crazies, if we can determine who they are, which is, I think, very problematical because, you know, you'd have to be monitoring your, you know, <laughs> face bag feeds. Um, you know, uh, and stuff. So they would, you know, I mean, I don't know how, I don't know how it actually could be done, but it's something needs to happen. You know, we, we really need to look at this and smarter people than me need to find a way to stop this violence. It's when I found Absolutely. out that the main cause of death between people between 13 and 21 was gun violence. I was, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I had no idea. I had no idea. I don't think people know that. I sure didn't know it. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't know it. And I, I had a friend that was, you know, killed by a gun, by a child playing with a gun. Um, as I wasn't even a teenager at the time. And I just remember that because it was a friend's sister and we were friends with the family. And I'm, it was just, you know, at that time, as, as a young kid, you're like, oh, my God, like, what is going on? Like, and this might be the generation, too, because, you know, I mean. My grandfather was in World War II and, and, you know, and knowing the way that I was raised and stuff. And I'm like, and then seeing other people and I know everyone's different. Everyone grows up differently. And I'm not saying anything is good or bad or, you know, it's all what we have to learn. But sometimes it's like, you know, you question everything of, okay, well, 
why wasn't again why wasn't the gun put away why wasn't the, why weren't the bullets somewhere else why you know you question those whys and and how how to make things better in the world and sometimes they're they're like at this point in our lives we may not have the answer but hopefully hopefully those whys and those questions will eventually lead to a better answer and solutions down the road i i can i can only believe that there will be there will be something done because the gun violence in every week you know, there's a, I don't know how many shootings there have been since the beginning of January this year. Do you know, Leslie? Mm -hmm. uh, my fabulous manager says there have been over 40 mass killings mm -hmm. since the beginning of this year. It's only the beginning of February. It's, uh, somebody's got to, somebody has to be the bad guy. You know, somebody's got to be mommy and somebody's got to be daddy. And I never forget when my father, who was an NRA instructor, you wouldn't have gone into that gun cabinet if your life depended on it. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. you were not permitted to mm -hmm. go into that or to even know where the key was. You were not permitted to do those things. <laughs> 50, oh, my man, my fabulous manager, Leslie Adams, says there have been 54 mass shootings 54 and we're I not mean, barely in february days, as of as of four days ago as of four days ago donna so i don't know if anybody has the answers but we sure need to start we really need to be looking at this and we really need to be looking at the uh the violence that happens with uh policing that is that's atrocious and abominable and that's training and that's picking the right people to do those jobs. And that's not making it be so, you know, military. You can have discipline. You can have, uh, people can be tough, but you don't need to be, you don't need to be abusive and cruel and, you know, take out your, uh, whatever your own problems are on some other innocent person. And so many times the person is innocent. I'm tired of that. I'm tired of hearing about that. I wrote a song about it called I Can't Breathe. And it, uh, it, it's how I feel. I just feel like we need, as a nation, somebody needs to, somebody needs to say the buck stops here. We're going to start doing things in a different way. I don't care if you like me or not doesn't matter. I don't matter. But what does matter is this sort of behavior has to be addressed. And we need to do it like grown-ups. Yeah. We need to be grown-ups. The world is not a child anymore. America can be, is a leader, and needs to stay a leader. I don't think we need to make her great again. I think she's always been great. Yes. And I, <laughs> Thank I, you. I really do. Well, I, I really feel that way. I, I had the most wonderful opportunities in this country. I, I'm grateful. I'm so grateful to have been born in this country. And, um, and I, you know, we can always be better. And that's what I think. Always be better. But I think we are a great country. And we don't, and I don't want us to forget that. I don't want anybody to forget that because we are already great. We just need to get right. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I can't agree with you more. So would you like to do our 13 crazy questions? Oh, boy. Go, go for it. <laughs> Don't ask me okay. any hard ones. I, I, there's only maybe one hard one, and I promise we won't get arrested yet. Maybe later. If, I worried, yet. About, if I worried about that, I wouldn't write songs like Texas Taliban. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So tell me, do you have any guilty pleasure music? If so, what is it? Guilty pleasure music? Yeah, you know, something that not everyone knows you would listen to that's like, you know, on that well, playlist? Well, no, because I, I, I don't, I, yeah, if I did, I probably wouldn't feel guilty about it. You know, it would be, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, it would, and a lot of times um, I like really simple things. Sometimes I'll listen just to some, you know, very simple Appalachian music or uh, 
you know, very rootsy, old, old music. Um, just to hear what people were doing 100 years ago, 50 years ago, the 60s, 70s, whenever they started being able to record it. But um, but not guilty, no, uh, uh, happy, really. Beautiful. So if I told you to finish this sentence, today my favorite song is? Probably ever, probably ever, my favorite song would probably be Desperado. Because it's sort of about the human condition. Come down from those fences, you know, let somebody love you before it's too late. Tell me, best concert you've ever attended? And yes, you could have played at it because someone asked that question before, so I'll just throw that in there. Um, I think one of the most important concerts I ever attended, I'd been, I had my record deal for about three years, and I was singing all this music, half of which was not anything I cared about very much. And I wasn't writing a lot of it after the three, about three years, because I was too, too exhausted. I was on the road constantly for three years, almost all the time. And so I was just singing these songs that I'd written before and songs that, you know, were songs that I liked. But somehow I lost myself. And I went up to somewhere way up in Maine. And there was this fabulous stage that was made. It was a Victorian stage. And it was all this lattice work. And it was out on the beach. And the sea was right there and all these boulders. It was on a beach somewhere. And Arlo Guthrie was playing. And Arlo I did a wonderful show. I think it was his birthday. And he decided that he was going to tell us a story. And he said, do you all know the story of how Amazing Grace was written? And the story that he told, it may not be exactly what the story really was. I don't know. But he said there was a whaling, uh, there was a slaver. Uh, a captain of a slaving ship. And he was uh, really a pretty tough, awful guy. And slaving was illegal, and it was horrible. And if they, if they would see Her Majesty's flag coming toward them, they would throw the slaves overboard in their chains, and they would drown. And they never cleaned. They were in layers in the ship and like pens that dropped that were slatted so all the waste and stuff went down into the bottom of the ship and the smell was overwhelming and if somebody was sick it was well you can imagine human waste for however long it took the ocean back and he this whaling captain fell in love with a christian this story moves me so much <laughs> fell in love with this Christian woman. And she advised him of the error of his ways and the cruelty of what he was doing and how wrong what he was doing was. And he was so moved that he wrote Amazing Grace. And then Arlo sang Amazing Grace. And then I went, oh, I forgot. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. That is beautiful. Well, you know, Arlo is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And that story, I can't tell it to this day without it because the song, I don't know about you, but when somebody sings that song, it just goes right to your soul. It was inspired, Absolutely. you know, and inspired piece of, of music and those kinds of songs I remember chris christopherson's song why me lord sung by him everybody else has recorded it but chris sang it and he meant it yeah. and he lived it and uh, if you your listeners have not heard why me lord by chris christopherson please hear it because it's also life-changing See, you knew the next song. I was the next question I was going to ask you was to recommend oh. a song to everyone. Oh, mm. well, that was a spirit 
doing that right there. That was yeah, so, uh, perfect. And, but and while, while we're still on this, a... I do want to mention that uh, for our listeners that don't know that you did a lot of firsts for women, you were opening up for guys that, you know, women weren't opening at that time in, in history, you know, for Merle Haggard and, and, you know, these, the guys that, you know, back then it was all guys opening for guys and, and you did a lot for women. So the women today really should every once in a while say thanks for, for you pushing forward in what you've done because yeah, I mean, you just really did <laughs> pave the way and help to create those barrier breaks. Well, I, I was very fortunate because I was one of the few women back then who was signed as an outlaw artist, which meant that I got to open shows for people like Willie Nelson and Hank Williams Jr. and David Allen Coe. I even played David Allen Coe's wife in a movie. But I didn't know that I was doing, I was breaking any ground for women. I had no, I had no idea what I was doing. It was just, that's where it was and the kind of music that I wanted to do. I always wanted to do that, that really hard country music um, that was, uh, had other influences in it. And, and I did get to do that. And I got to play the biggest stages in the country and around, around the, um, around the world. But my, my very favorite one was uh, in the nineties. Sometime I got to go to Europe and I got to go, with the great Hoyt Axton and the incredible Bobby Bear, who was like the original outlaw guy, and uh, Johnny Cash, the man in black, and my favorite singer-songwriter of all time, the incredible Chris Christopherson, and got to know them all a little on that tour, and got to be with them, got to play music with them, and got to go to little smoky underground taverns in between these big concerts we were doing. They'd go down and they'd take their band into some smoky little place. And you would hear a song. I heard a song, uh, Chris sang a song that changed my life. And I later recorded it. It was called The Heart. It is a great song. It is a great song. So let's transition to tell me something on your bucket list yet. Well, I've done a lot of the stuff on my bucket list. Um, well, I, I'm definitely going to be riding horses when I'm 80. That's that's a thing. When I'm 80 years old, I'm still going to be going, I'm still going to take a horse on a trail ride and probably a good long one. I want to get real sore. You know? <laughs> um, and, you know, there are, there are lots of things that I want to do that um, are probably not so interesting to other people. But I think that um, I had a dream when I was married for a long time. And when we retired, I was going to take horses and I was going to visit every national and state park and go riding in every national and state park. I still want to see every national park in the United States. And I've seen many, many of them, but I, I, I never get enough of them. Um, uh, they really are the most wonderful places. And, you know, you feel spirit stronger there than any other place. I mean, it's uh, these sacred places. And a lot of times you have to be careful when you go, because if you go in a tourist season, it can be kind of like Disneyland. You kind of have to go to these places in the off season to really see the serenity and the beauty that's there without 8 million tourists, you know, which of which you are one. <laughs> but that's, those are, those are the kinds of things I like to do. Well, I'll just let you know, I'll be the tourist in the summer because we always head out West and, and usually Yellowstone. <laughs> um, this year we're finally going to go Yosemite there in the and... summer. You go in the yes, summer. Yes, ma'am. Yes, oh, ma'am. And I've learned one. that you either have to go in the eve toward the evening for a hike or toward the morning. So I've learned <laughs> when when you should you know how to navigate. So, <laughs> so yeah. you like them too. You like I love to see, yes. you know, the Yellowstone River is just such a beautiful river. It it's is. just lovely. It it's just, you know, and, and that whole Paradise Valley that it runs through before it gets mm -hmm. to the park and the elk and I love nature. Uh, one of the greatest things I ever did was uh, go up to Denali Park, and I went all the way to the back of the park and saw every animal in the park. And that that is a life-changing experience because the vistas are so incredibly 
huge. I mean, you just can't believe that you can see. We went in the fall after Labor Day, so there were no mosquitoes. We actually could see Mount McKinley. And the park was in her, you know, the robes of autumn. And there were all these colors and these incredibly green, narrow uh, evergreen trees. And just the vastness of that place is, it takes your breath away. It's, it truly is life changing. People, you know, people uh, who haven't been there, I would say that's one to put on your bucket list if you haven't done it. Absolutely. I Absolutely. Go I have not Zealand. been there. I want to go to New Zealand. <laughs> that's, I really, that is a bucket list. I'm going to go there. Okay, just send me pictures because I love travel. So please. <laughs> well, you know, my, my problem is I don't really love traveling. I like to be at the place where you get to, but getting there, I have done so much. When I was 46 years old, I had a million miles on one of the four airlines that I was flying. So wow. as far, although, you know what I do like? I do like to travel by car. I do enjoy that because I have all my stuff, you know, mm -hmm. food that I like. Um, I don't have to, you know, dress up. Or, RV, uh, small RVs are good. Yeah, well, I mean, we actually go, we use them. Um, we use a, um, no, I, I think you call them SUVs when we travel a lot. And it's great, you know, and my guitar player loves it. He uh, likes to, he's, um, he enjoys things, historical things. And uh, Leslie, my manager, enjoys it. We like to get out and see the world's largest ball of string and you know, <laughs> the corn <laughs> palace. Hell's half acre. Yeah, Hell's half acre. Yeah, we went to Hell's yep. half acre. I I balked at the Devil, Devil's Tower because it was like I don't know how many miles, seventy five miles off the highway or something. And I'm going. Well, once you've seen one Devil's Tower, really, you've seen them all. <laughs> I am a little jaded. A little jaded. Oh, we'll go. Don't tell me then. We'll go one day when my rear end is in this tire. <laughs> riding, I was riding in the car as it was that day. Well, well, if we decided to do a movie about your life tomorrow. Who would you want to play you? Oh, that's a weird question. <laughs> well, I would have to be somebody utterly beautiful <laughs> because I never have been. So I would like, let's, let's represent her. Let's represent her. But you know, actually, you know, in, in a real, um, in a real way, who would I like to play me? Well, well, I would say Helen Mirren. But Helen is a little, um, she's a, in some ways m more of a lady than I am, I think. Or well, at least she, she appears to she's be. She's an actress. So she's an actress. actress. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, that is a question I really, I really can't. I really can't answer. Okay. I can't. Um, how do people well, answer that question? They, uh, did they just take people, their favorite actors or something? Yeah, sometimes just, they just take their favorite actors or actresses and yeah. Or throw them in or yeah so that's pretty much it yeah i don't know i was i was asked a couple times to play janice joplin and i would have been honored to the it was the people who actually have the rights to her actual music asked, asked yeah. me a couple of times and um i would have done it but the script was the same sort of script as the rose um yeah. where you know she's just a sad person and lonely and she's a drug addict and that's not the person i met the person I met was a big, strong, politically hip, very, very <laughs> smart lady, big lady, much bigger than me. And, um, and I thought, you know, nobody's played her. Nobody's done that part of her. They always do that. The Rose, which is a beautiful story. I mean, it's all beautiful. And I'm sure she, there were parts of her that were like that. But I had lots of friends who knew her. And um, I think she was a lot of fun. I think she was a lot of fun. I would have if the script had been a little differently written. I think I might have done that. But who could play me? Good grief. <laughs> <laughs> the poor soul. <laughs> oh. So tell me, do you have a game plan? Now for don't zombie? ask me anything hard. <laughs> I'm hoping this is easy. Uh, I can give you some suggestions on it, though, if you need. For zombie apocalypse, do you have a game plan? I can tell you what a couple of people oh, have told me. That helps. Oh, come on. I have an outfit. 
No, my yes. friend and I are we we are we are ready. We are ready. Okay. We're going to put um, lawn chairs on the roof. We're going to have cocktails, and we are going to. We've had we've got our our outfits planned. If you saw them, you'd probably be horrified. But um, the last thing she sent me was a, a boot made out of sliced cucumbers with a high heel and a and her toe sticking out of it and a pair of uh, boots that were shaped like horses feet with gold hooves. So you can imagine with the fishnets and, you know, the, you know, we have hats, we have everything. We're ready. We're ready. We're ready. Okay, well, th I'm, that happens. I'm just coming to find you because, you know, this is just going to be fun then. Oh, we're just going to have a good time, right? We we might we might even have surfboards in case there's a big wave or something. But if it's a, if it's a nuclear disaster, we're just going to sit there and we're we're trying to figure out if it would be better to have, you know, like a, a bikini on so that you know the flesh just kind of flew away, <laughs> uh, <laughs> or 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 you'd want to have more protective things so you just kind of roast it inside it. We you know we've thought about that a lot. And you should see the glasses, the sunglasses, <laughs> and the masks. I I have a gas mask I'm particularly fond of that uh, was a World War II gas mask. So I may be wearing that. But it could screw up my eye makeup. And, you know, when you go out, you want to go out with a bang. Absolutely. <laughs> You're invited. Oh. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad. I'll have to come up with an outfit to, to join you all. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So. And make sure that, you know, it's a, it's a really good looking outfit because it'll be the last one you ever wear. Absolutely. <laughs> So speak, speaking in co, uh, morbidity terms here, um, hypothetically, oh, I came to you and said, I have a dead body and I need to hide it. Do you know a good place? Well, I would say, I would say, you know, in Deadwood, remember Swedgen? <laughs> Swedgen. Oh, Round of the pigs. I, I think I'd find a, I think I'd oh. find a pig farm and let him go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, perfect! Tell me, I watched Deadwood. I watched Deadwood so many times. I felt like they were family. I really loved that, <laughs> <laughs> and I especially love Swearingen, the guy who plays him. He's so wicked. Yeah. Oh, so is that your favorite movie? No, no, not by a long shot. My favorite movie is Blade Runner. Oh, I loved it. I have the director's cut, and I think a lot of science fiction movies that followed after that mm -hmm. took a lot of a lot of the pieces of Blade Runner. But there were some incredible performances in that movie. And just recently, um, I've been watching the Avatar movies. I think they're utterly beautiful, utterly beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, there are some GI Joe stuff in it that I get a little lost in, but. But I love the animation, and I, I just think the colors and everything. I think they're they're um, I think they're a good art form. My my uh, I have friends who think that they demean native people. I didn't feel like that at all. I thought that they were actually kind of honoring um, native people um, in a simple way. It's a movie, you know. It's a movie, mm -hmm. and if it can teach us to remember that everything that is you know is connected we are all connected from the coldest farthest star to the warmest closest sun we are all connected to one another all the time all the time while we're connected does that mean you would go to karaoke with me i think not I think I'd I think I'd say you guys go on, have a good time, have a drink for me. I'm gonna stay. I am really not a party person. I gotta tell you. I'm pretty quiet. Pretty quiet. I'd rather stay home and read a rainy night or a snowy night than anything with my dogs. I have a herd of dogs I live with. All of them have been rescued from death. You know. I've been in dog rescue for a long time and I have a foundation for wild horses called the Let Them Run Foundation. And uh, my wonderful manager, uh, Leslie, is on the board of that. Uh, she is the treasurer, the money person. 
she was the secretary. I think she's still the secretary and the treasurer. <laughs> because, but we, uh, you know, what we do is uh, we res rescue a lot of wild horses go to slaughter mm -hmm. and for food in other countries and stuff. And what we do is we rescue as many as we can and thousands of them still go. But we rescue as many as we can. We rehabilitate them and we, uh, if we can, we put a little training on them so you can handle them, and then we rehome them. And um, what we do, we don't do the hands-on stuff. We uh, we raise money for the people that really do the hands-on, boots-on-the-ground work, which is heartbreakingly difficult because a lot of the animals don't make it. They've been so abused in the process of going to slaughter that or being rescued from um, the auctions where that happens that they are already in really poor shape when uh when we get them so we've had a lot of uh what did she say um one of our advocates that we support heavily i think has already done i think 78 horses this year that she's and that's you know her numbers this one young woman uh, with a her she had 93 last year she had 93 last year and she uh her her website is chili like cold c h i l l y pepper p e p p e r dot org. You can see the work she is doing, and you can see some of the work that we support with that website. And I recommend it. Um, she will. She shows you. It's heartbreaking work. It's heartbreaking work. A lot of times she'll save the babies, and the babies will have been so mishandled that they're injured beyond where we can save them. And that happens to her. I don't know how. She has a lot of faith. She's a very she, a woman of faith. And it's the, I, it's the only thing that sustains her. She, I don't know how she does it year after year, but we're happy to be part of that and then help her and other uh, small mom and pop organizations that don't have the time to raise a lot of money for themselves. That's awesome. And make sure you all go check that out. And if you can, donate too. You know? Oh yeah. I hate to yeah, say every to dollar that. helps, but it does. Oh, it does. She's so grateful for the, she'll get a dollar and she says, I know these people. You know, I know it's the most that they can give. It it touches her when she gets a dollar. She said, I know some little old lady in Massachusetts is living on a fixed income and is sending me a dollar. She said, and I'm gonna make it work. She uh she's quite an amazing person. She's her name is Palomino. Her name is Lori Armstrong. We all call her Palomino because she's blonde and uh, she's extraordinary. So I think you'll enjoy looking at that website. Chili, as in cold, C-H-I-L-L-Y, pepper, P-E-P-P-E-R, dot org. And our foundation is called Let Em Run. L it's L-E-T, apostrophe E-M-R-U-N, dot org. Let them, and you can get that from Lacey J. Dalton. If you go to the website, you can, it'll get you there. If you want to see what we're doing. And, you know, we do, we raise funds with concerts and, and uh, you know, things that, you know, auctions and stuff we do. And I'll try to put all the links in the description. So that way everyone can just go click the links Look and at check you. them out. You know how to do that. <laughs> I'm so bad on the computer. Just I'm like, <laughs> don't touch it. Just back away from the computer. <laughs> Oh. Leslie's very good on it, thank God. <laughs> oh, so well, Doc, you, uh, uh, last question, though. I want to ask one more question. Oh, Do you have yeah, any there, words? Oh, is there another? You're just full. Yep, of it's, it's the last of the crazy questions for today. So, any words okay. of wisdom that you love to live by? Well, I could be unserious and say, trust God and keep your bowels open. <laughs> or I could be serious and say, when you get out of when you just get out of sync with everything, Holy Spirit, make my heart right. As out of the heart come all the issues of life. Holy Spirit, make our hearts right. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. It has been a pleasure chatting with you today and you are welcome back anytime and you are welcome to call me anytime you want to chat too as well. Just love talking with you today. Hey, well, I, you know, I've really enjoyed meeting you. I think what you're doing is extremely important. I'm so happy you're doing it. If there's anything I can ever do to help you, 
that will support you, please just don't hesitate to call. We are we are right here, and this is something I believe is well well worthy of any support that you need from us. So let us know. Thank you. I appreciate it greatly. And thank you, friends, for joining us for another episode. Have a wonderful day. Oh, and check out the links in the description. <laughs>If you enjoyed today's episode of Crazy Women Country, don't forget to give us a thumbs up. Be sure to click the subscribe button for new interviews weekly. And thank you, friends, for joining us today on Crazy Women Country, where women's voices matter.